This is the Food and Justice Podcast with Brenda Sanders. Hello, everyone, and thank you for again for tuning in to Food and Justice with Brenda Sanders. I am very excited for the guest today, uh, just ready to just jump right in and get started because we have so much to cover. But first, I want to read the bio of Dr. Columbus Batiste. So here we go. Dr. Columbus Batiste is the Chief of Cardiology at Kaiser Permanente Riverside and Moreno Valley Medical Centers. He completed his residency in internal medicine and fellowship in cardiovascular disease at Loma Linda University Medical Center. He is also known as the Healthy Heart Doc, and he endorses a holistic approach to healthcare, emphasizing nutrition, stress reduction, and exercise. And so first of all, thank you so much for being on the the show today. I really appreciate it. Oh man, this is a long time coming since we were hanging out in Kansas. It was Kansas City, right? Kansas City. Kansas wow. City. Yes, 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 yes. I got to meet the Brenda Saunders. Oh my that gosh. was that was that was one of the highlights <laughs> of that trip right there. So I, I know I was happy. I was happy. Oh. Well, that is so flattering. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, obviously, likewise, I mean, I had heard so much about you and so much about your work before I ever met you. So um, just getting into the questions here, I talk to a lot of plant-based doctors, um, and I'm so blessed to be able to meet so many uh, doctors who are promoting um, the plant-based diet for health. But I'm really interested to find out what's your story? Like, what's your mm. origin story? Why did you decide to get into um, the medical industry? Why did you decide to become a doctor? Mm. I mean, you want the truth? The truth is I wasn't really given a choice. Ooh. So, I mean, I'm the last of the litter. I'm the pleasant surprise. They like to say, I don't like to say I was a mistake. <laughs> no. So my oldest sibling was 16 years older than me. Mm. And so by the time I came around, my dad was like, listen, you gonna be a doctor, a lawyer, or you're gonna be a business person? What are you gonna be? Uh, no I guess pressure. a doctor. I guess a doc. <laughs> I guess a doctor. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I was blessed. I was blessed. So I mean, you know, the things were placed in order for me to go down that pathway. Um, and so I was very fortunate, based on the 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 work in the back of my parents and those who went before me in order for me to achieve and get here. You know that that's one of the reasons why I was preparing for another talk. And I was coming across this nice little diagram that really talked about, about covert versus overt racism. And one of the, the, the features there was bootstraps, right? That covert statement that people say, oh, I pulled myself up by the bootstraps. No, you didn't. Mm -mm. No, you didn't. You crawled up on the backs of everyone that's mm. there. And that's realistically what, what I, I, I did. And so, you know, I think back to those times. I think back to just that youthful arrogance that you have sometimes as if you know everything. Oh, yeah. I, remember, I remember being in school and I remember, I remember coming home and my dad was, uh, this is a man who's educated, fought and struggled, get educated, all this other stuff like that. Multiple businesses decided to paint curbs to put my butt through school. Mm. Right. In addition to like selling insurance, teaching college, do, doing all these other different things to make extra money. And I had the nerve to kind of sit there like a little bit like, I don't want to do that. Wow. I don't want to go out there. Like, you know, I mean, it's just you you think about that in reflection of the opportunity that you have. And so a lot of that lays the foundation of why I see there's an importance of giving back and recognizing that many other individuals just like me didn't have the opportunity, mm. right? For whatever the reason may have been. And not that they didn't have the intelligence, much smarter than I am, but they didn't have the opportunity. Mm. Wow. Wow, that is so humble. And I am not sure that I've ever heard that level of humility from like professionals. It's not to say that pro professionals tend to be arrogant, but I, I just haven't heard it. So <laughs> I really appreciate that. Well, I mean, it's it's not even the issue of being humble. It's an issue of being honest. Mm. I mean, if we're honest, no one is more intelligent than another person. It's all about opportunities. I always go back to that old... You're too young to remember this movie, but Eddie Murphy back in the day did a movie with Dan Aykroyd called oh. Trading Places. Oh, and I Trading Places, they you. decide they is it Trading Places. He's a bum on the street, Eddie Murphy. That is Dan Aykroyd is this polished Princeton uh, financial 
uh, guru out there. And these old rich white men decide that they're going to place a bet to see if they could change the fortunes of their life. Mm. And they proceeded to do so. And so they took this person who had an indigent status and transformed him into this financial guru and turned this financial guru because of life circumstances mm. and made him turn to a life of crime. And that's how easily our, our courses can shift and change. And so to overstate our presence and our worth and our value, I think is a disservice to ourselves. It's it really, it really truly is. So it's about the process, you know, it's mm. just about the process of learning, giving back and, and becoming aware. Mm. Of course, now I have to go back and watch Trading Places because <laughs> I didn't even know that whole message was in there. So I will definitely oh, yeah. be watching that again. I got a few um, more of those if you keep listening. Okay. <laughs> I certainly will. I certainly will. So so you um, deal with folks with chronic um, health issues, chronic diseases. And um, and so we've all, a lot of us have heard now, especially folks who are doing uh, work in like food justice, that these chronic health issues disproportionately affect um, African-Americans. And so I wanted to hear your take on that. And why is it that these chronic diseases would affect African-American people um, more so than other folks? Yeah. You know, I, you know, when I look at disease burden and first I have to lay the foundation, right? Because the first, the easiest way for individuals to turn is to say, well, there must be some sort of genetic weakness huh. that's there that, oh, you must be prone towards this, that somehow you're inferior, that some, somehow there's something going on. But studies have confirmed over and over again, the fact that from a DNA standpoint, from a genetic code standpoint, we're more similar than we are dissimilar in that there is one human race. Mm. Now, here's the key. Now, understanding that, we understand that that race and racism is a really a social construct. We all understand that. We've heard that terminology before. But I propose that health disparities are also a social construct. Mm. Because as the science and epidemiology, the study of, of trends across has really come to light, we see what? That it's zip codes that matter. Yeah. These zip codes and these determinations. And so you say we we so this has become kind of like one of these hot topic uh hot, hot ticket words we love saying zip codes matter right mm -hmm. but let's dig into that a little bit more if you look at zip codes and you look at the construct of the environment that these these constructs they they have a history in redlining now what is redlining a means in which that cities and areas of living were constructed to keep certain individuals living in particular areas that were felt to be not unworthy Right. So in the le lesser areas and predominantly those were African-Americans who were who were pushed over into certain areas. So now we have these areas where they're devoid of 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 food, healthful foods. They have areas where the temperature is even higher. Mm -hmm. These areas where the pollution is higher. These areas where the lighting and the noise is higher. These all these areas where now the crime and the policing is higher. That We have all of this that we create this crucible. This, uh, this this crucible of conflict that happens. And now we ignite it with the food, right? So we have all this stressors, right? So when you live in an area that's that's distraught, now the, the, the schooling, the education system goes down because tax system association. Now we know too as well that that now the, the maintenance of the roads and the parks and the, the walkways are not maintained. We see all this. The studies have shown that there's not even the same amount of parks in certain cities or areas where African-Americans live compared to others. So when we see all of these things in, in totality, you begin to understand this distinctly and uniquely why someone like my father, who was born in 32, said to me, as I was looking at buying a house, come make sure that 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 where you're buying the house isn't a, a trash dump. Mm. It, it wasn't something that was covered over. I remember why is he saying that? I'm not asking the real estate guy this. In my arrogance, like I told you, mm. arrogant. What is he, Dad? What are you talking about? But he's referencing this historical issues that he himself had faced, right. of where we were partitioned and moved towards certain areas that were less desirable because of pollution, because of factories, because of waste that was out there into the water that's there, because of mounds of dirt and toxins that were there. And we're living and breathing in power lines that were there and causing issues and risk for cancer. And we wonder why is it that we have health disparities? Mm. That's why. Oh my gosh, this is a whole sermon. Listen, I grew up in one of the housing projects in Baltimore City, it was in a stone throws distance from the city incinerator. Mm. 
And I mean, that thing, I remember just looking up and it's just chugging out all this smoke day in and day out. And it like, you know, all the kids had asthma and, you know, all the older adults had some kind of cancer. And, you know, it was just looked at as, you know, this is just what happens. Like mm -hmm. kids have asthma, you know, and other kinds of it's respiratory normal. diseases. Right, right. And um, I mean, it's like you just described my life. You just yeah. described the entire, I mean, it was hotter. The first time I went into the woods, it was like magic. Like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh. Like, because that that concrete and the asphalt and the brick yes. and everything is just bouncing that heat off of everything. Yes. And it's just hotter, yes. you know? And it then is. you go in amongst trees and it's just like, you just went into some kind of fairy tale land. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, everything you're saying is just really hitting home. I wasn't even expecting that. So you got to give me a second. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is really just so important. It's so it is. It is. I mean, just the subtleties that start to come back to your memory about your childhood growing up. I grew up in Compton, California, South Central. Okay. And I ne and I, I never forget, like, I mean, my dad would kind of put us up in this car and we'd go wherever, right? I wanted to yeah. just kind of hang out. Kids nowadays, you have all these toys and gadgets. They're not, oh, no, I'm good. I want to just get out. I just love seeing the lights. And I never forget, it struck me, not until I became an adult, that we'd go driving. My dad would drive almost 20, 30 minutes to go to the grocery store. Mm. I remember, I remember like going to this grocery store and I still remember it now as I talk about it. the lights were bright. I could see the rows of apples and the different color fruits and vegetables all there that looks so like tantalizing. Right. And we go around, we come home and spray it on the table, mm. but we wouldn't go to the grocery stores locally. And the few times I did, you saw the bulletproof glass that was there. Yes. You saw the grime and the dirt. You saw instead of walking in and seeing this beauty and the lights and you're seeing all the fruits and vegetables, I'm seeing what? I'm seeing boxes of stuff I wanted. I'm not gonna call out the manufacturers, but all the processed cakes and cookies mm -hmm. and pies and, and sodas and everything like that all around that I didn't see when I went the other place. And now I understand and we all understand what that was. Yeah. Living in the food desert and food swamp compared yeah. to moving, going to a grocery store. Like recently, I, I, a couple of years ago, I went on a trip and they had the finest grocery stores within the same shopping center. <laughs> I ever, you name the grocery oh. store that's like top shelf all the way around. I never saw any of that stuff as a wow. kid growing up. Yeah, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. That is that is really interesting that they have them in the same shopping center. I mean, like how many crazy. apples do they need? Like what, <laughs> exactly. what in the world? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. This yeah. is, um, yeah, it's, Ooh, we got to do a whole show about that because <laughs> I want, I mean, it, it's just so important and it's important that we grew up, you know, that, that the people who grew up in these circumstances, uh, having these experiences actually speak up about yes. it because what oftentimes happens is that people come from outside of the community and try to speak for, the people Correct. who are being marginalized in these communities. And it's like, no, because you will never know. No, <laughs> you will no. never, ever, ever truly understand what it's like to be the victim of this kind of, and it's targeted, you know, yeah. like you were saying with the redlining and everything. I mean, the kinds of food that were just, you know, trucked in and dumped into the projects where I grew up, it was just the worst stuff you can possibly think of. Pickled pig feet, you know, I mean, all the like packaged chips and cookies and crackers, penny candy, you know, mm -hmm. where like mm -hmm. if I just walk around the neighborhood for like three or four minutes, I mean, three or 30 or 40 minutes, I'm going to find a few pennies, right? Just on the ground. So <laughs> let me get over, you know, and buy me a couple pieces of candy, you know, just like, of course, cigarettes and just yes. anything, you know, that folks um, are going to use to like kind of pacify ourselves or, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And like, we're going to go and get those things as opposed to like your dad who, you know, knew enough to like, at least that there was better food outside of the community. Yeah. Um, I didn't actually realize that until I moved out of that mm. community. And then I started seeing a lot more of the world. And I just thought, this isn't right. Correct. You know, this isn't right. And that's why I had to come back. You know, That's a lot huge. of people are like, why are you doing this in these communities? These people don't care about their health. They don't care about the environment. They don't care about anything. And it's like, maybe they don't know because we didn't know. We didn't know. Correct. It wasn't that we didn't care. 
It's Correct. just we work in all these jobs like your dad and, you know, we're like people didn't have time to be like flipping through, you know, some environmental magazine <laughs> or some, you know, yoga magazine or whatever. Yes. Like they that's not what they were doing. They were trying to make ends meet. Right. That's right. And so, it, you know, that so the information has to come to the community. And that's what both of us are engaged in. So. And, I, and I'll tell you, you know, it's it's the thing I, I despise, right? So when I'm in my leadership roles that I despise is when we characterize individuals as being non-compliant or that they don't care. Mm. And I really ask, well, okay, this 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 idea came to, to, to fruition here over the past couple of years that people actually have jobs and the jobs prevent them from being able to go in. Mm-hmm. And we call them, essential, now this the term essential workers, right? but who are the essential workers? Black and brown people for the vast majority. And so when you look at that contextually, and if I, as a physician, I'm talking about myself and my own kind, if I'm keeping bankers hours, how can I expect this person to come in? Mm. And if they do come in and I'm giving them five, 10, 15 minutes for them to share where I give off a cold demeanor, Mm. I don't connect with them at all. And now I say, well, they're not taking the medication because I'm not, I'm insensitive and I'm too insensitive to inquire about their finances, a fear of offending them. So I give them a prescription they can't afford. I don't explain the side effects. And then I characterize them as non-compliant because they show up late or they miss an appointment and don't take the meds. Mm. And I wonder why. And now we have this perpetuation of the cycle of disease that persists there. And you wonder now these folks are coming and they're stressed. They're hearing this bad news, the negativity of everything like that. And the foods that are killing us are the same foods that give us some sense of partial relief because they act as anxiolytics. That all of a sudden the high sugar, the high fat, it's like, oh, I feel good Yeah. in that moment. So I keep going back forward. So then you come and you tell me, well, I'm going to take away something that's making you feel good amidst all of the strife. I don't want that. Well, mm-hmm. don't talk about my food. That's what I like. I'm good with whatever X, Y, and Z is. But no, that's they're using it. And this is what we say inside of the uh, one of the, the the shows I do called Slave Food Project, that stress equals demands minus resources. So mm-hmm. when we feel as if our resources don't match the demands of life, oftentimes we turn to fake resources that many others in the community have called like the, we, 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 we we're trying to avoid pain. We're trying to seek pleasure and conserve energy as best as possible. Well, that sounds exactly like processed foods to me. Yeah. Right? Mm. High energy, no effort, gives you immediate pleasure. <laughs> so and it allows you to conserve energy and you store and it gives you pleasure right at that point in time. So it's so complex when you really look at this vicious cycle that many individuals, and that's why I love, I love um the characterization by Isabel Wilkerson in Cast, right? <clears throat> because when you look at the cast, for those who haven't read the book, Cast, a phenomenal book. Yeah. And, and my wife hates it when I say I read books. I listen to my books. I'm too busy. So on the road, I'm always... True. <laughs> no, I got to get in. I just want information, right? I don't yeah. care how I get it. <laughs> yeah, but it's so deep because it's just like, this is where we have expectations of where a person should fall in society. And so you may have people who look the exact opposite of you and I who say, well, I'm not privileged. And maybe they aren't compared to those in the cast above them Mm -hmm. because they're looked at a lower part. But there's layers to it where if I'm Obama, I still am going to have be have a ceiling in my cast Mm -hmm. that's there. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And you mentioned. Um, slave food project and the first thing that comes to my mind I, I want to talk about like how it came to be and and what the um, thought process was behind the project um, whenever I hear like slave food um, I'm always reminded of a lot of the foods that um, you know I grew up on because my grandmother was you know she was like the the matriarch of mm-hmm. the family and she was preparing a lot of the same like traditional foods um you know the ham hocks the yeah. chitlins the you know i mean it, it was greens but it's gonna have like the big yeah. meat in it and mm-hmm. um 
And I mean, those were neck, bo- uh, neck bones, neck bones. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yes. So you know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about. I, I mean, and about. even, you know, my grandfather was really into like the spam and the mm. uh, scrapple and stuff like that. And so uh, potted meat. Um, and so these were like the foods that that we actually came to look forward to. Mm-hmm. Right. Because that was what was being made by the matriarch and patriarchs. Um, of of the family and um and so like we were literally raised on it and looking back I'm just horrified I mean I'm horrified even to know what a lot of that stuff actually was (laughs) because of course I didn't know at the time so that's what I think of you know when I think of slave food food and justice is made possible with support from defund big meat a grassroots effort to encourage strategic collaboration across all sectors of global justice Find more information about Defund Big Meat at defundbigmeat.org. A Well-Fed World, an international hunger relief and food justice organization advancing plant-based foods and farming to create a nourished and climate-friendly future. Find out more about A Well-Fed World at awfw.org. Better Food Foundation an organization that promotes dietary changes to build a healthy, equitable, humane, and environmentally sustainable food system. You can find out more about Better Food Foundation at betterfoodfoundation.org. And Farm Sanctuary, a farmed animal sanctuary working to fight the disastrous effects of animal agriculture on animals, the environment, social justice, and public health through rescue, education, and advocacy. Find out more about Farm Sanctuary at farmsanctuary.org. Um, so can you talk about the Slave Food Project and how it came to be? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I always really wanted to do was as I kind of got into the whole concept of, of, of plant-based nutrition and the power to transform lives and health, was I realized that one cookie cutter message is unfair to give. Whether or not I'm speaking to a South Asian, I'm 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 speaking to someone that's of Hispanic or Latino heritage. If I'm speaking to African American, that it needs to have some cultural relevance. It needs to be appropriate. That's there. And so as I continued, I realized who just like I chose interventional cardiology because those who are in the greatest need are those who are in the throes of having a heart attack. That's what I need to work on. And so I decided at a certain point that I wanted to tailor a message not ignoring the whole group as a whole, but targeting people of color. And so when I met up with a good friend of mine who has his public health doctorate and so forth, and he's a physician, a medical doctor as well, uh, Eric Walsh, we start toying around with concepts as we start walking through kind of like what we wanted to do. I'll be honest, I wanted to really create it. The goal was to create it into a documentary, a docu-series. Mm-hmm. That was the ultimate goal. So we started crafting out. And part of the idea for the docu-series was, hey, let's go around doing lectures and we'll film that part there and we'll integrate it with different things. Um, that was the inception. So as we were putting together the concept, it was like, you know, let's walk through the history. History is so important for people to understand where you've been to understand where you're going and where you're at right now. And to understand that we're saying that this is our culture and who we are, but is it really? Mm. Well, let's dig back a little bit further. That wasn't the culture inside of West Africa. That wasn't the way that things were prepared there. And as you start peeling through the layers, you realize the fact that, okay, these were foods that were really, like when I was in some of the some of your vegan colleagues out there may not like this, but when I was a, a kid growing up with our dogs, we would basically scrape off what we had and didn't want off of our plates to the to the dogs on the on the uh, inside their pan. We had a bunch of dogs, love the dogs, everything of that sort, but we throw it out there, the bones, everything else like that, all the scraps. Mm-hmm. And as you start reading through this, you realize that we were treated, we meaning people of African descent, were treated like dogs. Mm. And all the cast offs. Everything that you were making something fine for the people who reside in the house, but everything else that was discarded was given to us to eat. And so these individuals had so much resiliency, so much innovation that they were creative, that they created a whole entire cuisine Mm. off of things that were cast off. And you talk about brilliance. That's brilliance right there. And so, yes, of course, historically, we're now highlighting that transition in those foods that people eat is what we do, what a lot of people of African descent do, and we have soul food. But what I we try and pull out inside the Slave Food Project is, what about the resiliency that these people had? 
our forefathers had by, by after working long hours, we have to go and till the garden. That we have to go and find the different uh, 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 vegetables and various things that can go ahead and supplement their nutrition because they weren't given enough. Mm -hmm. That they would grow the fruits and they had this ability there. Let's highlight those, that aspect there that built the resiliency. And then as you begin to look into it a bit more, you realize that, okay, the concept of slave food is really a double entendre. Because now we fast forward into the modern era as we move through the great migration and we're combined inside these cities where you can't grow food, that now we're subjugated to our environments. Mm -hmm. That now all of a sudden make a better choice, but all I see around me are fast food establishments that now my income is poor, is limited. And so now I have FDA, I have government subsidized foods that either through welfare initially WIC and so forth that were given that were not as ideal, especially at the inception of it, that these things, government cheese, everything else like that, that now this is what I'm eating. Right. That do I really have a choice when I can get $5, uh, excuse me, five burgers for a dollar fifty, But if I go buy a salad, it's going to cost me 10 Bucks. And I don't know if the family, if it's going to fill me up, if the family's going to like it, if I buy it and it goes bad because it's already looking like it's a poor quality, yeah. I've wasted my money. Do I really have a choice? Right. And people are saying, just choose. If you know better, do better. Well, can I really do better? And so you're enslaved to your environment. And that really struck home as we were coming with it. And I, I remember when I transitioned over towards eating completely whole food plant-based. I had all this stuff on my uh, in my basket, putting on the conveyor belt. Last minute, some of that stuff that haunts you inside the grocery store lines started haunting me. It started calling <laughs> to me. It started calling to me like Denzel. I'm going to you another movie, right? Denzel, <laughs> I think it was Flight. It was Flight. Denzel was there, and all of a sudden, last minute, he snatched up the alcohol and, and had it. He was trying not to have it, right? That was me. I'm like, I snatched the, I snatched the stuff on the side of that candy. I put on the conveyor belt, and the guy was like, he scanned. He was like, yeah, man, I thought you were the healthiest person I ever oh, seen. Oh, wow. I realize you're just like the rest of us. Mm. Mm. I look down for a second. Give me that candy bar. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so we're enslaved. No more, despite our best efforts, we're enslaved to our environment. And so this double entendre meaning is the fact that, yes, we transition historically, Bring it into the modern terms of why is it that despite every effort to do better, I somehow cannot? Mm. Why is it through every effort I'm trying to walk more, I'm trying to sleep more, I'm trying to be more mindful, I'm trying to eat healthy, but somehow I cannot? I'm enslaved to like this process. I'm enslaved to social media. I'm enslaved to, to this food that's here, mm. and I can't break the chains of it. And so that's really what it's about. It's about building resiliency. And the message is pervasive. I, you know, I think this message of slave food that we were giving, we were attempting to give, is no different than the message of a superhero movie. Mm. You're just wrapping it inside different wrapping, whether it's Wonder Woman, Batman, Superman, or the Black Panther, mm. right? It's a message of good versus evil, good guys versus bad guys. And in the end, the good guy wins, gets the love interest, <laughs> whatever it is, unless there's a part two. <laughs> then maybe it's, it's held on, right? So in this message, the message is the answer is the same answer. It doesn't matter what I'm wrapping the framing of the movie in. It's nutrition. It's nutrition that's going to play a role in the environment. It's nutrition that's going to go inside of the uh, uh, the awareness and and sanctity of animals. It's It's nutrition that's going to go into destroying these health disparities that exist here. Um, so, and, and really, I, I believe plays a significant role in mental health too as well when yes. we go about things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That is that's interesting. I um so so you have within first of all this this project, would you still be open to this project being like a docuseries? Is that still is, there, is okay. Okay. Of course. Of so course. We have I mean, to make that happen. <laughs> so I mean honestly, because there are all these docu series coming out about you know serial serial killers and yeah. you know all this stuff. Look, we need a docu series about the history and the present. You know, traditional versus you know present day. Like this sounds like something that really needs to happen. So I, I'm that's we were watching a, a documentary and no. No shade thrown at the documentary at all. Um, love, love, love the book. It was powerful. I use a lot of the information in there. 16, 19, incredible. If you haven't watched it, start checking out on Hulu. But my wife was sitting there saying, she was like, man, your documentary would have killed 
Mm-hmm. It'll be it because we were integrating not just nutrition, but looking at the stress component, mm. not looking at the zip codes, looking at all the, the aspects that really laid the foundation as to why we're here right now. And we felt it's too heavy to, to deliver in two hours mm-hmm. and, too de- and to be honest with you, too depressing. And because one of the things I've realized is the fact that we can't just hit people with all the negativity of all the, the bad stuff. Yeah. really about focusing on the resiliency and there's so much work that's happening with resiliency. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Don't, I'm, I'm not, not going to go off the rails continually. I know I'm going off the rails and just having, the, oh. I feel like I'm just having a conversation with you. Yeah, that's why I'm just yeah. talking like this. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please, please feel free. And now don't give, don't, don't, uh, reveal too much because people be stealing out here. They be stealing. <laughs> they have started. You know I mean, people have come to me like, Oh, can I pick your brain? Next thing I know they're getting funded. <laughs> For some stuff that that the idea they got from me. So let's, you know, we'll talk off camera yes. about how to make this happen because it sounds powerful. It sounds yeah. like a powerful project. And, um, you know, I've talked to a lot of folks. Uh, my goal with Food and Justice uh, was just to talk to people who have expertise in all the different areas of the food system. And so, uh, because people don't understand how the food system works. You know, there were folks who were like, well, you know, if, if another Whole Foods opens, then the food system, you, you know, will be magically fixed. And it's like, do, do you think that's how it works? Because that's not how anything works, you know? Not even close. At, not even close. And so I've been talking to people from, you know, folks who, uh, who have expertise in how the food system in prison works Mm -hmm. to like people who are working on um, food system issues at the legislative level. You know, um, now I'm so blessed to have you talking about, you know, the medical industry. And so, um, so for you and, and the work that you've been doing with the slave food project, like, is there any particular insight or anything that's been revealed that is particularly um, like striking for you? Gosh, you know, I mean, everything was. I, I'll tell you the intricacies from the government level um, to to some of the things that were meant for good, <laughs> maybe mm. that that had that derailed into being a little bit more harmful. The mm. things that were cast in the light of capitalism that were once again derailed towards harm that and targeting and focusing. And you know, I love two phrases. You know, we've all heard the term "social determinants of health." But the reality of it is, is we need, to, we need to undertone the moral determinants of health. Mm. Where's the morality in terms of it? We need also to bring in the political determinants of health because you mentioned legislation and there's so much going on behind the scenes that you and I and every average American are completely ignorant of. We have no idea of the laws that are being vested and the deals that are being sought and the negotiations and, and so forth, the grease, the palms that are being greased to kind of mm-hmm. make things happen. Mm-hmm. And so there has to be a targeted approach. I mean, I, I think it was a wonderful start with what Washington did on September 28th, you know, in terms of having the first nutrition, the nutritional conference in nearly whatever it was, 40 plus years. Mm-hmm. I think that's a start. So it's not a finish. It's a start that's there and it's important, but I think there's a lot that has to happen. And you know, I'll tell you, one of the things that comes out of slave food, comes out of lecturing, comes out of the cooking classes that I have taught is I don't need a, no offense, I love Whole Foods. Don't love the price, but love Whole Foods, right? <laughs> I don't need a Whole Foods to eat healthily. Mm-hmm. And I tell people I met with um, Blue Zones for the city I live in. They came in to try and try and um, make my city a blue zone city or my little area here. So I, I had the good fortune to be able to meet with one of the, uh, the, the executives from there. And I said, you know, what really needs to happen? I said, you can actually take the idea. I've had this idea for quite some time is that we go into the, one of these major super chains. I mean, I mean, I'm not going to give any, any, unless you're getting advertisement for them, I'm not going to call their names out here, but you know, we all know those, those major super chains where you can get groceries, you can get clothes, you can get automobile stuff. And it's, they basically knocked out every mom and pop shop around. Yeah. Why not partner with these spots and have like healthy heart docs meal mm-hmm. for this or have blue zone meal. Get this ingredient here out the frozen section. Why frozen? Because like I had a patient one time who told me, Doc, I have roaches in my in my 900 square foot single bedroom apartment. I completely shifted 
all that talk I was doing with other patients stopped it. It's mm-hmm. like, we're going to get canned stuff, canned beans. We're going to get frozen vegetables that won't go bad. We're going to find ways for you to make bowls, for you to make burritos. I'm a, I'm a, we're going to look at the fast food places that you do go to. Let's try and craft out and carve out what are the healthier options for you to go here. And we're going to make a plan plan i don't want there to be anything we're going to plan for the worst case scenario when you don't have money when you don't have access and what are you going to eat and how are you going to get food in those particular instances and that's what we did we took time to go ahead and do that and that's what's important when we kind of look it's not it's not about having these glorious grocery stores that's nice but we have to change we have to change the mindset of people to let them know that yes you can that there's resiliency that you can, I can find something. I can be resilient like my forefathers. When, when in the midst of nothing, right, of devastation, I can find something and I can find a way to kind of make food work and do it from a health standpoint. So mm. that is, I can't even imagine. I mean, I can't even, n- no shade, like you said, but I can't even imagine a doctor taking that much time to really like spend getting to know um, you know, a, a, a patient or, you know, somebody who they're working with and like really care. And it's not that I'm saying that people don't care, but I, I'm in and out, in and out, get, go, I got to yeah. get, you know, move on to the next person. And I definitely feel that way. I feel like it's yeah. just like, you know, you got five minutes and then yeah. you got to go, you know? And so that, that is really commendable because I can't even imagine. Well, you know, before you commend me, I've, I've, I've stumbled and fallen and everything else like that. I tell the story a lot of times about this guy and he wasn't, didn't even look like me, looked the opposite of me. And I made an assumption walking in the room, mm. smelled the smoke, looked a little disheveled, dirt and grimy in the nails. I saw his stuff and I was running behind, double booked, had meetings. I was like, okay, you're going to need to have surgery and just walked in, blah, blah, blah. How you doing? All right, I'm seeing here, you're going to need to have surgery. We're going to need to get this done, that done. And so we're going through, and he stops me. He's like, Doc, is there anything else I can do? Stop from typing. Look up for a second. I'm like, yeah, okay, you can go whole food, plant-based, no salt, no oil, no sugar. You can go in hard like that, and you might have a shot or whatever else. I keep looking back down, talking, and then he says to me, okay. Mm. He said, okay. Mm. (laughs) Brenda, he said, okay. He said, Mm. okay. Wow. I felt ashamed in that moment mm. and stopped what I was doing, stopped my hustle, stopped my bustle, and had a conversation. This man went on to make some significant changes. And that was a judgment. That was a stereotype on my part. Mm. That was an assumption on my part about what he would be willing to do. And, and I said, who has given me the right to determine who receives the information? Mm. Right? It doesn't matter what color you are, what background, what finances you have. I don't have the right not to give the information. Now, you may discard me and put the hand up immediately. And I'm like, okay, that's good. But at least I should introduce it to everyone. Mm -hmm. So that's what I attempt to do. Am I perfect? I'm sure you're going to find people. No, he didn't tell me nothing about that. (laughs) You're going to find someone out there. You're going to find someone out there. Am I perfect? No, but I, I make it a point to try to be intentional every day. Mm-hmm. But I'm human like everyone else. I have moments that are not so wonderful, I'm sure. Just right. ask my family. Wait, <laughs> now family doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> they uh, always got something to say. Look. They do, don't they? Don't they? Don't they? <laughs> the Food and Justice Podcast is proud to be organizational partners with Afro Vegan Society, Food Empowerment Project. Grow Where You Are, and Vine Sanctuary. So I, um, I saw this uh, phrase that you have said um, that really kind of struck me, and I, I would love for you to speak more to it, um, and that is racism as a unique form of stress. And look, I immediately knew it was true. I didn't even know how I knew it was true. I just know I have been the victim of it. And I'm still, like, to this day, don't, don't let me go to Whole Foods or, you know, uh, uh, Trader Joe's or whatever. And uh, I don't even know if Trader Joe's has the um, the self-checkout. But any of these places that has a self-checkout, look, it could be five white people 
stealing them people blind. They're going to be watching me at the, the self-checkout. And it is so stressful because I'm just like, okay, I have to look like I'm not stealing. because I, <laughs> <laughs> And it's just ridiculous. It's Tell ridiculous. It. It, and, and it's just a form of discrimination that is so blatant, but it's also so subtle. So I can't yeah. even go and talk to anybody about it because unless you are, you know, somebody who has this experience on a day to day basis, it's like, well, how, they're just doing their job. How do you know that it was personal? Da, 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 mm -hmm. da, da. And like, and I know that it's personal, but there's also a stress in having to prove over and over and over again, you know, so just I want to yes. hear you talk about, you yes. know, racism as a unique form of stress. Oh, man, I wish I didn't have to talk about that racism as a unique form of stressor. You know, it's 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 but it's true. I mean, so I mean, I think a good starting point when it comes to speaking about subjects like this is to look at the work of David Williams. So David Williams, uh, Harvard University, has done a plethora of 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 articles and research and has been a part of various things. And one of the things that he's been a part of has been something looking at what's called the everyday discrimination scale everyday discriminatory scale. And this is almost like, have you ever been made to feel somehow that you're not as smart? Have, have you ever been made to feel as if somehow you're, you know, as if you're, you're bad or you're about bad, uh, uh, stealing or whatever it is like that. And it's a scale that begins to add up and these, think of it like microaggressions that are there to kind of be predictive of adverse events. And so studies have shown that when you, we are stressed, we understand what happens with stress. Our stress hormones kick up epinephrine and so forth, norepinephrine, we're getting going, we're in this fight or flight. Pupils dilate, the blood shunts away from our, our, our hands and our skin gets cold and clammy. It goes to our organs, our liver begins to produce like uh, uh, sugar to, to, to feed the, the large muscles so they can go ahead and respond. Our blood vessels begin to crimp down and create a hypertensive state, preparing us for action on a regular basis. And so we know that this is a useful form of stress or use stress that can be helpful in terms of running away from an animal or in terms of, a, you will hear stories of mothers lifting cars up to save their child. That's a useful form. But what happens when stress is chronic, it's persistent, it becomes distress, that now all of a sudden that thing that was meant for good is now turned into harm and it's harming the body because now the body gets weathered. The tremendous work that's been done by Dr. Geronimo looking at African-American women and looking at the weathering and superwoman schema and showing that this erosion that begins to happen in the body leads to shortening of telomeres, which are the ends predicting your longevity that leads to a risk of disease. Mm -hmm. So now you translate that over. And what they mimicked is the fact that in racism, there still is this uptick of stress hormones, that in racism, we still see this, that study so much, even in the Journal of American College of Cardiology, it's like my proverbial Bible you know, as a cardiologist. They've done studies showing that individuals who are living in, who are uh, low so socioeconomic status, racism, you get that the stress that triggers from the amygdala, this small little spot that seeds the fear, and that's what you're talking about because of experiences that either you've had directly or you've observed in others, that now you remember, I go through this grocery line, I need to make sure, my dad told me as a kid, always make sure you get a bag going out. Never walk out without a bag and a receipt mm -hmm. out yeah. of a store. He didn't tell me why, he just told me, boy, to just make sure you get a receipt and a bag going out the store. Okay, dad, right? We and I didn't talk back back then at all. <laughs> and so, but the reasons why is, why? Because the, the, the events that happened to others, of being accused of stealing, of policing, of various things like that, laid the foundation that every time you go through this line, it triggers an emotion inside of you, the stress hormone cascade. So imagine that every turn, just from memory, from observation, you're having what is a normal daily activity turn into a stressful inducing activity that now you just see the police, it could be your friendly neighborhood police that's driving up behind you, maybe. But now all of a sudden, your hormones get triggered inside of you. You're not doing anything wrong. You make sure you're at nine and 10, you know, <laughs> yeah. two and 10. You know, you make sure, well, where's my license registration at? Let me make sure. Whereas uh, other people may not think about that uh, at all. And so there's studies that have shown that stress, perceived racism, increases the risk of breast cancer, perceived racism, increase the risk of carotid artery blockages, perceived racism, increase the risk of coronary artery calcification, which is a precursor for heart events that happens, that, that perceived racism is an increased marker for cancer.
that we see this relationship and now we're understanding the physiology of it, which means the way the body is working against itself or responding to what it perceives as a stressful state. But now because it's so persistent, that repetitive nature is causing harm with you. Mm. And that's why racism is a unique form of stress. I was, the uh, last thing I'm gonna say with this is that I was making the analogy with someone. I was on another interview, another show I won't m- mention because it's, it's gonna pale in comparison to your show always, oh. is they lost weight, a tremendous amount of weight. And so he brought it up, he said, yeah, sometimes some of the individuals, they'll, they'll say, why are you guys touching on racism again? Everything has to have to do with racism. And so I said, okay. I said, so tell me about how you felt when you were morbidly obese. He was like, oh, it's horrible. And he talked about how the shame and how people just treated him and and cast him off and made assumptions about his personality and who he was, all those microaggressions. And I said, man, I said, so, but things have changed now since you lost all the weight. He said, oh boy, have they ever? I said, now imagine for a moment that you're born in your skin and you have all these assumptions made about you that are negative, but you can't change your skin. Mm. It doesn't matter what you do in life. It doesn't matter what degree you have, how much money you have you're still perceived the same way. You still get that same interaction as what you had when you were obese. That's the power of racism. Mm. That's the detrimental effects of racism. That's what leads to stress. And that's what leads to despair with people. That's why it's important to talk about. It is. It is. Do you know, my goodness. So, so when you were talking about the body's response, it made me remember there's this one um, grocery store, <clears throat> that I, I go to almost exclusively because they have the same stuff as Whole Foods, but mm. at a much cheaper, like, you know, maybe like uh, two thirds of the price. Oh. And so I go there. It's a, a chain that we have here. I don't even know if it's anywhere else. Um, but I do go to the self checkout because I like to be a, left alone. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. want to talk. And, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> just trying to get in and get out. So, yeah. So, but I can feel the. The, you know the per the employee that they have there to like you know watch me i can fit like the, so mm-hmm. my hands get cold mm-hmm. whenever i go to and i i was just i was just saying to somebody who else i said why do my hands always get freezing cold when i'm at the checkout and i was like i don't know something's wrong with me i don't know what it is <laughs> but every time i'm going through the self-checkout my hands it's like all of a sudden, like the blood is gone or something. And I'm mm-hmm. like, my hands are, and I cannot believe you just answered that question for me. Like, I'm having yeah. a stress response. Mm-hmm. Wow. Absolutely. Maybe I Absolutely. should just, you know, just suck it up and have the superficial <laughs> conversation with the cashier. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I, <laughs> even though my mind is clearly on something else, maybe I just shouldn't do this self-checkout thing. But the thing is, I should be able to do the self-checkout. Exactly. You shouldn't have to. to. Thank you. You should not have to do what you don't want to do Uh, as it relates to something simple like that. It, I mean, but it's just, and it's just the little things. It's the little things. They just add up and add up and add up to the point where you start to doubt yourself. And that's when it really, you know, now I don't doubt myself that, you know, maybe I am stealing. Like, not like that. No, I know, I know. (laughs) You know, just doubting whether or not you're actually good enough. And, and, And I think that's, see, and that's the key point. Is about is there's two types of responses to situations that are challenging. Just said the answer right there. You have the stress response and you have the challenge response. Mm. The challenge response is that yes, we're inside the midst of this huge pandemic. Go back a couple of years, whatever it is. The challenge response is I'm going to try and buckle down and write my book. I'm gonna try and buckle down and spend time with my family. I'm gonna try and buckle down and do some of the things that I've been wanting to do for a while that now I have an opportunity to do. I'm going to change my perspective and my outlook on what's going on. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to educate, right? The um, uh, individuals. And so maybe the person who's who's kind of just sit eyeballing you, right? If they're looking at you all crazy, it's just like, okay, hey, what's going on? How you doing? Or whatever else, you know, and, 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 and engaging them. So in that way they understand that, you know, not in a way I don't necessarily need to mean preaching at them or be like, what you looking at me for? You know, or nothing like that. But I'm just me. I mean, you know, whatever it may be, it's an opportunity and you develop a challenge response mm-hmm. as opposed to a stress response. You recognize that, okay, this is how my body's feeling because my body is preparing me for action. Now that action may be, I get ready to go on stage mm-hmm. to give a talk. Mm-hmm. I may get a little hands, a little clammy. I may yeah. get a little 
frog in my throat, right? <laughs> a, little, a, little, a little dry mouth. And so recognizing, okay, it's my body preparing me to go ahead and deliver the information. But guess what? Nobody knows what I'm supposed to say. Mm. If I forget something, it's okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I can always come back or whatever it may be. Um, and that's not, that's easier said than done. But I think that it's possible. I was listening to something with Kobe Bryant. Slightly is not slightly. It was different, but uh, applicable. He was talking about failure. He was like, well, I care about failure. Okay. I go home. I fail. I'm going to have to get up the next day and start again. Mm. It's a process that matters. Okay. I do it and I succeed. So what? I need to go back out and do it again. Right. right? And so it's, so it's, it's just, it's like recognizing those feelings, recognizing that I mean, you know, that I may not be able to be successful in changing the, the mindset of these individuals. Hmm. We have to transform our mind as much as possible and take control and not let our mind control us. We have to control these experiences can't control us. We have to control them as best as possible. We have to use them appropriately. So we recognize danger, recognize situations, but we have to, otherwise we're going to kill ourselves. Yeah. And that's, that's the point of that. Yeah, no, it's true. It's absolutely true. I mean, just the anticipation, the constant yes. anticipation that you're going to be discriminated against or mistreated is just as bad as the actual mistreatment, yes. you know, if not worse. So I can I can definitely relate to that. Um, <laughs> oh, you, you have a couple of other I mean, it's just like you have so much. So um, you're the founder of a nonprofit organization, um, Heart Healthy Nation. Um, and so, so what's that about? Um, yeah. it feels like it has something to do with cardiology. So <laughs> if you can elaborate. Yeah, he <laughs> healthy Heart Nation. So if I'm completely truthful, start Healthy Heart Nation as like a means in order to try and really do the work I'm doing about nutrition, and everything of that sort, and to bring people to the table. And my wife co-founded with me and brought in another close friend of mine from college, um, as the, the core there. And it was just like, look, you're talking about all these social determinants of health. We can't approach Healthy Heart Nation as just solely health because health is so inclusive of other things. So decided to bring a business arm, education arm, a justice arm, a community action arm, because understanding that unless you deal with the health of all of this, your health of the community is going to fail, right? And so then it was a matter of, okay, trying to recruit. Let's recruit lawyers and judges and have people who look like us, mm. who are trying to do the right thing, not exclusive, but making an point and an intention on addressing ills inside of our community that's there. And so under the umbrella ship of that, started doing more of the slave food work under Healthy Heart Nation. When I speak, I, t I donate the money to the organization. And so out of that, we're doing stuff like we're, we're relaunching. We did a pilot last year in several barbershops, launching a barbershop initiative, barbershop beauty salon and churches, where we're going in and we're actually delivering blood pressure machines and try in there to leave in place there. So a number of research has been done on the power of screenings in barbershops. We're like, they, they come and they go, they get the publications, but how about we leave it there and work? So some of that's happening around the country, but not enough of it. So we decided we wanted to leave out there. There's roughly about 100,000 black barbershops across the United States. So our goal is let's, let's set this as our goal <laughs> to kind of put a blood pressure machine in every barbershop, a beauty salon, and a church and start that process. The second big thing that we're doing is then we started giving out scholarships. We raised money, gave out $10,000 worth of scholarships for students to go to historically black colleges and universities to help their tuition and help them get through. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do is trying to, to work with another group that does STEM. They do a lot of engineering and coding and so forth. And so brought them into the network there. And so we're helping to support and, fit and feed uh, any individual. But we're, we're once again, our focus is on those kids who are in disparate communities of African-American descent and, and um, black and brown. But it's open to everyone. So I say that always because I don't mean it to be exclusive. But this we're intentional in addressing those who are in the greatest need at this moment. And then last, our big initiative right now is, is collaborating with Plantrition Project that's really led the space in educating healthcare professionals about the power of nutrition across the board. And we're developing a conference called Health Equity Longevity Project, the HELP Conference. And the intent of that is to address the issues and burden of disease inside the African-American community by all the leading African-American um, uh, authorities and to have a mixture of conversations slash panels slash lectures on day one on day two we're bringing in the community what's the role of places of faith 
in rebuilding the community? What's the role of businesses in building the community? What's the role of places of education in building the community? And so as we go around to these different, um, have these different conversations there, hopefully we can develop the goal is to take action items there from that and really be able to begin the process of really mending our community and building that resiliency that's needed in order to help us thrive and survive just the onslaught of stressors that continually come at many uh, marginalized communities. Hmm. And then, so, um, and, and the conference that you w were just talking about, what is that conference called? So it's the HELP, H-E-L-P conference, okay. um, Health Equity Longevity Project Conference. And that's, April 2nd through 4th in Huntsville, Alabama. Now, why on earth mm. from California did I choose Huntsville, Alabama? <laughs> well, Hunts Huntsville is one of the largest growing cities inside of, is the largest city, I understand, inside of Alabama. It's actually it's the home of three historically black colleges oh. um, within the city of Huntsville, too, as well. And one of which is my alma mater. So I decided to kind of oh. go, back, go back out that way. And nice. have it. Um, it's close proximity to Atlanta, close proximity to Tennessee, mm -hmm. and many of the other southern states, Hardtack Belt, and everything like that. So, so I will see if I can get a sponsorship to come because this yes. is uh, <laughs> this is a really important and and honestly historical um, conference. And I think that um, I think that it needs to get the support that it deserves. And I'm hoping that it's already getting the support that it deserves. Yeah. But if perchance it is not, then I will definitely do everything in my power to make sure that it yes. gets the support that it deserves. Because this is groundbreaking. You know, this is some leading edge stuff. And I, I think that, you know, I first of all, it, I just need to be there. So, you know, that's just first and foremost. I think everybody... And I have to apologize straight away because I did not try hard enough inside of my day and my time to reach Miss Brenda Saunders because oh you are not only not supposed to be there, you're supposed to be part of a panel of, uh, during that time, too, as well um, there because of all the wonderful, incredible work that you and your organizations have done to really do exactly what we're speaking about, right, oh. and what we're talking about. And so the goal is not just to come from an angle of just physicians preaching at you right? There's a component to that, right? We'll, we'll do all our preaching on day one about the health aspects, but now let's get down and dirty with mm -hmm. like, how do we go about change? Yeah. You know, li literally from the healthcare perspective, from the community center, uh, uh, community perspective, from businesses, from churches, all these things that are pillars in our community. How do we do it so we can move that way? And that's where individuals like yourself, powerful change makers like yourself are important in this conversation. So Thank you for supporting it. And I hope oh, yeah. it does. I, I know it will do well. And, you know, there's other branches to it. So, you know, I'm looking at political aspects and bringing in individuals to talk about the political angle with it, the research angle of it, and all the different things. And I see this as something that will continue on. Mm -hmm. That's a messaging that will be powerful for all of us. There's so much wonderful, wonderful work that you're doing. Um, we will have information about all of your projects, um, ways to, to connect with you on the uh, fjpodcast.com um, website, which yes. is the Food and Justice website. And, you know, if there's, if folks, you know, is there anything else before we go that you One would other like? Thing. To, all right, all right. I'm learning this. I'm learning this. So I am going to drop my book. We were talking about this earlier. Ooh. I'm going to drop my book. And so that book should hopefully hit... Um, at the latest, I'm looking at April. I'm hopeful it'll be ready in time for a couple of things I'm doing. Um, mm -hmm. But if not by April, I want to make sure it's done right, not just done. And so that's the key, but it's called Selfish, you know, and it's it's a cardiologist guide to, 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 to basically defeating stress, right? Overcoming mm -hmm. a stress and broken heart. And so it's my approach towards kind of uh, longevity, towards like overcoming a lot of the stuff we've all been suffering with right now. Selfish. Oh, my God. It's selfish. It's selfish to live a life of purpose. Mm. Okay. Well, I can't wait. Look, when, when the pre-sales hit, you let me know. I'm going to pick up like 20 of them. We're going to start right. getting them out to our, you know, Afro-Vegan Society community. Like, just let me know. And I'm there. I can't Will wait. Do. I can't wait. Thank you so, so Appreciate much. I mean, you. this has been just such a pleasure. And uh, I can't wait to talk to you again. Honestly. Yes. This has been great. So, and thank everybody, you know, who's tuned in to the show. And I know you've all had such a enlightened experience as I have. And we will catch you again next week. 
Right. Thanks for tuning in to Food and Justice with Brenda Sanders. See you next time.